Please note that filming text on the whiteboard requires extremely bright studio lighting. Subsequently, sunglasses were worn during the filming of this video to prevent damage to my retinas. A note on how to use these sessions. Jot down the notes as we go, so we'll help you learn the material in a more interactive way and you can use in a study note later. Also, in the small chance that the discrepancy arises between the professor's notes and mine, always go with your professor. They're the one grading you. Lastly, any examples or analogies used in the session are not meant to support or criticize politics, religion, or lifestyle. They're merely learning tools to help understand the material. Alright, guys and girls. It's time to get cracking. Okay, so in today's session, we're going to be talking about ethers. How this session is going to lay out is, we're going to start by talking about general information so we can get acquainted with these guys. We're then going to move on to the ways we can make ethers. I've listed up here that we have three plus one ways to make ethers. And no, you guys, this isn't because I can't count to four myself. The reason why I've listed it up here as three plus one is because we have three ways to make straight chain ethers and one way to make a cyclic ether, an ether inside a ring compound, okay? So we've got three plus one ways to make ethers. We're then gonna move on to stuff you can do with ethers, like reactions that ethers can undergo and other things that ethers can do. And last but not least, we're gonna finish up by talking about a special reactive ether, also known as an epoxide. The reason why this epoxide is a special ether is because it is reactive. So you guys are going to find out that in general information that ethers are known to be not that reactive. This epoxide is a special ether because it is reactive, okay? So go ahead and get this outline down and we'll flesh this out as we go through today's session. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the general information about ethers. Okay, so first things first, you guys. What is an ether, or what does an ether look like? Well, an ether is going to have an oxygen that's bonded to two alkyl groups. Okay, so here you have an oxygen that's bonded to one, two alkyl groups, and these alkyl groups can be whatever carbon groups you want. It could be a CH3, a CH2CH3, any carbon group you want, okay? So let me go ahead and designate this by putting an R group on this side and an R group on this side, saying that an ether is an oxygen that's connected to any two alkyl groups. And hey, this oxygen is gonna also have two lone pairs off sticking off of it, like that, okay? So this is an ether, an oxygen that's connected to one, two alkyl groups, okay? Okay, so one thing I want you to notice about an ether is that it's got an oxygen connected to a carbon on this side and a carbon on this side. And hey, you guys, is oxygen more or less electronegative than a carbon group? Oxygen's more electronegative than carbon, right? Meaning that oxygen's gonna be pulling electrons away from this alkyl group, away from this alkyl group. So let's go ahead and designate this with a couple dipole arrows, showing that oxygen's pulling electrons away from this alkyl group and also away from this carbon group, right? So hey, you guys, if oxygen is pulling negatively charged electrons towards itself, is that gonna make it more negative, more positive, or stay the same? more negative, right? If it's pulling negatively charged electrons towards itself, it's gonna become partially negative, right? In turn, if these alkyl groups are getting the electrons taken away from them, that's gonna make them partially positive, partially positive. So what you see here is, you guys, an ether is made up of a partial negative on the oxygen and partial positives on the carbons. The thing though is you guys, normally when I tell you to look for partial charges, I tell you to look for partial charges because it's a source of reactivity. Normally whenever you see a partial charge, you say, hey, if you see a partial negative, a reaction is gonna happen there to help cancel out that partial charge. But with ethers, you guys, even though these ethers do have partial charges on them, the charge is very, very weak, okay? So this oxygen is not that much more electronegative than a carbon. It's not that much more electronegative than a carbon. So even though it is pulling slightly on these electrons away from these alkyl groups, it's only gonna have a partial negative charge, not that strong of a negative charge at all. 
Same goes for these partial positives. They're not that partially positive, okay? So an, an ether is generally unreactive even though it's got these partial charges on it because they're very, very weak partial charges, okay? Okay, so I'm telling you that ethers are not very reactive at all. It's very rare to see an ether undergo a reaction. So why then am I telling you about these partial charges that exist in an ether if no reaction is virtually ever going to happen at any of these places? Well, let me first tell you that ethers are commonly used as great solvents in reactions. So whenever you do a reaction, you throw in your starting material, your reagent, and then you throw in solvent to help this whole reaction process. But why would ethers make good solvents? Well, it's because ethers are generally not reactive, yet they still have these slight partial charges on them. How does this play a role in ethers acting as solvents? Well, we've got starting materials that we want to react with reagents that will eventually form end products, right? We need to throw in solvent to help stabilize this entire process. Why is an ether a good solvent? Well, because ethers are not reactive, so we can count on them to not react with the starting material and not react with the reagents to get in the way of this reaction. Yet, ethers also have slight charges on them that can help stabilize the charges that develop on the reagents and the starting materials. So whenever you have a reaction, you always develop partial charges on your starting material and your reagents that need to be canceled out, that need to be stabilized by surrounding solvents. So the solvent can help stabilize, but it won't get in the way of the reaction. So this is why ethers are great solvents. They're not reactive, yet they still have these slight partial charges, okay? So that's why it's important to look at these partial charges in an ether. It's also important because these partial charges tell us how soluble ethers will be in water, and also the boiling point of ethers, which is really important to know whenever you're dealing with a solvent. You want to know its solubility in water, and you also want to know its boiling point. So let's go ahead and take a look at how these partial charges play a role in these two things. Okay, so we've got partial charges in this ether that will affect its solubility in water and also its boiling point. But the one key thing I'm leaving out of this story is that these partial charges involve an oxygen. And whenever you have partial charges involving an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, then you're dealing with hydrogen bonding, right you guys? So hey, these partial charges involve an oxygen with a partial negative on it, meaning that this ether can participate in hydrogen bonding. Okay, so remember, in hydrogen bonding, there are two players. You have hydrogen bond donors and you have hydrogen bond acceptors. This ether is only a hydrogen bond acceptor, right? It's not a donor because it doesn't have a hydrogen connected to an NO or an F. You've just got an oxygen here that has a partial negative on it, so it can exist as a hydrogen bond acceptor, but not a donor, okay? So let's go in and write this down, that ethers these are hydrogen bond acceptors but not donors. Okay, so how does this affect an ether's solubility in water and also its boiling point? Well, remember you guys, anytime you can participate in any kind of hydrogen bonding, whether you can accept or you can accept and donate, anytime you can participate in any kind of hydrogen bonding at all, it will dramatically increase your solubility in water and also your boiling point, okay? How we judge this though is by comparing one solvent like an ether to another solvent like an alcohol or like a hydrocarbon solvent. So let's go ahead and compare our ether solvent to a hydrocarbon solvent and also a alcohol solvent. Okay, so I've put up two solvents here of comparable size to our ether, so we can compare these in terms of solubility in water and also boiling point. Okay, so we have an alcohol solvent and also a hydrocarbon solvent to compare to our ether. Let's go ahead and start off by looking at our alcohol solvent. 
We've got an oxygen that's more electronegative than this carbon and more electronegative than this hydrogen, pulling electrons away from this hydrogen and also away from this carbon, making this oxygen partially negative, right you guys? So we're dealing with a partial negative on an oxygen, meaning that we already know that this alcohol solvent can act as a hydrogen bond acceptor, right? So this oxygen, immediately we know it's a hydrogen bond acceptor, and also after you see that you have a hydrogen connected to that oxygen, you know that this is gonna be a hydrogen bond donor as well, okay? So let's go ahead and write this down next to this alcohol solvent, that this is a hydrogen bond donor and acceptor. And hey, you guys, the more hydrogen bonding you can do, if you can donate and accept, that means you can do twice as much as the one that can just accept, right? And the more hydrogen bonding you can do, the more soluble in water you're gonna be and the higher your boiling point is going to be, right? So hey, you guys, if this alcohol can both hydrogen bond donate and accept, and this ether can only hydrogen bond accept, which one do you think is gonna have more solubility in water and a higher boiling point? This alcohol, right you guys, since al this alcohol can both hydrogen bond donate and accept, then it's going to be able to do twice as much hydrogen bonding as our ether. And the more hydrogen bonding you can do, the higher your solubility in water and the higher your boiling point, right? So in terms of solubility in water and boiling point, I'm gonna rank alcohol first, then it's going to be our ether, and let's see where our hydrocarbon solvent will fit into this puzzle. Okay, so let's take a look at our hydrocarbon solvent now. You've got a carbon connected to a carbon connected to a carbon. You have all the same atoms in this compound, right? So you don't have any atom that's more or less electronegative than another atom, meaning that you won't have any dipoles, you won't have any partial positive or partial negative charges anywhere in this compound, right you guys? Moreover, you won't have any hydrogen bonding either because there is no nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine anywhere in this compound, okay? So let's go ahead and write this down to distinguish it from the alcohol and the ether solvent that you have no hydrogen bonding. You don't have any hydrogen bond donating, you don't have any hydrogen bond accepting. This guy can't do any hydrogen bonding whatsoever. It doesn't have a nitrogen, oxygen, or a fluorine, okay? So hey, let's go ahead and compare this hydrocarbon solvent to the alcohol and the ether now in terms of solubility in water and boiling point. So hey, we said that the more hydrogen bonding you have, the higher your boiling point will be and the higher your solubility in water will be, right? So let's compare this hydrocarbon to our alcohol. Which one do you think is going to have higher solubility and a higher boiling point? This alcohol that can both hydrogen bond donate and accept or this hydrocarbon solvent that can't do any kind of hydrogen bonding whatsoever? this alcohol solvent that can donate and accept, right you guys? So we know that hydrocarbon will definitely be lower solubility and lower boiling point than an alcohol, but what about when it comes to comparing it to an ether? Which one will have a higher boiling point and which one will have a higher solubility in water? Well, which one can do more hydrogen bonding? Ethers can at least hydrogen bond accept, right? They can't donate, but at least they can accept. This hydrogen bond, this hydrocarbon can't do any hydrogen bonding whatsoever. So we know ethers will have a higher solubility and a higher boiling point than these hydrocarbon solvents, okay? So let's go ahead and put our hydrocarbon solvent at the end of this list. Saying that when it comes to solubility in water and boiling point, alcohol is first, ether is second, and a hydrocarbon is third, because alcohols can both hydrogen bond donate and accept, ethers can just accept but not donate, and hydrocarbons can't do any hydrogen bonding whatsoever, right? So when it comes to boiling point and solubility, alcohol is the most, ether is second, and hydrocarbon is last. Okay, so just to clarify, because even though we said alcohols have the highest solubility in water and highest boiling point out of these three, that doesn't mean it's any better of a solvent than an ether or a hydrocarbon in a reaction. Because whenever you do a reaction, you just pick an appropriate solvent for that specific reaction. And you pick it based on things like solubility in water and boiling point. But you don't always want the highest, you don't always want the lowest. You just pick an appropriate one for your specific reaction. But I wanted you guys to get some practice arranging these from highest to lowest because it's good to know. And I also wanted you guys to see where ethers fit in on this whole trend because that's the chapter we're going over right now, okay?